The second talk is a culture talk and it's being given by uh, Chris Russo and it's on methods development at the LMB. And this is a critical part of uh, the culture of LMB to, to develop methods uh, to improve uh, the, our ca capacity to uh, take on uh, and make new discoveries. So Chris uh, Carroll's uh, from uh, Detroit in Michigan. He studied for his PhD at MIT and, uh, and Harvard, combining uh, physics and medicine uh, under Jean Golovchenko and Daniel Branton. And uh, during that time, he worked on problems in high resolution imaging uh, with aberration corrected electron microscopes. Uh, he then moved uh, to the LMB to take up a postdoc with Laurie Passmore and has been developing new methods for cryo EM. And he started his own group at the LMB out of uh, uh, that uh, uh, move and studies the physical phenomena that limit uh, the resolution of cryo EM to enable the development of new devices, instruments, and methods to improve the imaging power of the electron microscope in biology. And I think we uh, all look forward to his talks uh, uh, and uh, this one should be uh, really interesting too. Okay, hello everyone. Today I'm gonna to delve into the culture of methods development at the LMB and I hope to convince you of why creating new technology is actually essential, essential to advancing science. In many ways, the culture of the LMB was established by its founder, Max Perutz. But to understand how this happened, we will have to explore a bit of history. In so doing, we will look at the culture of methods development at the LMB and why it has been so important to its success over the long term. This is a picture of the back of the Cavendish Laboratory where Max and his colleagues worked on the structure of biological molecules. At the time, they were still part of the physics department, but they were already funded by the MRC. The hut was a dilapidated shed outside the Austin wing of the lab, which you can see in the background. This was the department chair at the time, Neville Mott's solution to what to do with the growing MRC unit working on protein structures that was taking up more and more space. It was literally a shed outside that was scheduled for demolition after the previous group that occupied it had moved to MIT. With Mott's help, the demolition order was overturned and Perutz, Kendrew, and the group occupied it in 1957. Uh, and this allowed them to clear out a bunch of space in the Austin wing that uh, was later occupied by solid state physicists that Mott wanted to recruit. And this hut was considered temporary space while a new home could be found. But Perutz and Kendrew in the MRC unit being shoved out in the shed were increasingly frustrated by the lack of space and resources when they knew the problems that they were working on were of the utmost importance and they really just wanted to get on with it. So something had to be done. As it happened, Fred Sanger, who was in the biochemistry department, was also funded by the MRC. He too was frustrated by a lack of space to expand his work on protein sequencing and the restrictive nature of the department at the time. Sanger and Perutz decided to join forces and see if together they could conceive uh, and convince the MRC to make a new laboratory with plenty of space for their growing research programs. Sorry, this got clipped in here. So Perutz with Sanger's encouragement wrote to the MRC in 1957 to convince them to fund a new laboratory for the express purpose of combining the two groups in a new lab to work on molecular biology. The MRC agreed to fund it with a minimum of effort, but actually finding a site and getting approval from the university proved much more difficult than getting the money. It took another two years to sort out all the negotiations with the various powers that be. And finally, a plan was laid out in 1959 to construct the new laboratory on an empty site south of the city. The medics in the university had also wanted to establish a new site as they were outgrowing the Addenbrooke's house buttle in the center of town. So the first buildings to be constructed on what is now a very large campus were the new Department of Radiotherapeutics, which you can just see in the background of the photo, and the LMB. In the end, it was to house several groups funded by the MRC, including Perutz and Kender's group from the Cavendish, Sanger's group from biochemistry, Hugh Huxley's group working on muscle at the University College London, and Rosalind Franklin's group at Birkbeck, who were working on the structure of viruses. 
Sadly, Rosalind Franklin died of cancer in April 1958, so she did not live long enough to move into the new building herself. But her group, which was taken over by Aaron Klug after her death, did move to Cambridge in 1962. The move to the LMB began at the end of 1961, and the stores and workshops were the very first things to be set up. This was not an accident. Michael Fuller, who came to work with Max at the Cavendish, was given 500 pounds to equip the stores with whatever chemicals the scientists might need, and Len Hayward, the engineer and instrument maker for the unit at the Cavendish, fitted out the mechanical workshop with the latest equipment for designing and constructing scientific instruments. It's hard to overstate the importance of these decisions in the history of the lab. Let's consider a couple examples to understand why. Perutz and Kendrew were both working on determining the structure of molecules using X-ray diffraction. The technique, in simple terms, involves taking X-ray pictures of a crystal of molecules, like this one you see here on the left from John Kendrew. All these spots encode information about the structure of the molecule, in this case, myoglobin. But going from photos like this to a 3D structure was no small feat and involved the concurrent development of many essential technologies. One key was the X-rays themselves how to generate them, how to control them, to hit the crystal accurately, and how to create a pattern with the sharpest possible spots. To appreciate the problem, I have to tell you a little bit about how x-rays are actually made. The simplest way is just to shoot an electron beam into a piece of copper inside a vacuum tube. X-rays just sort of spill out everywhere. But it immediately became clear that the x-ray sources commercially available at the time were not ideal if you wanted to do proper crystallography. The beam was dim, X-rays had a range of different energies. The copper would heat up to the point of melting quite easily, even when cooled, and the coherence of the beam was poor. One innovation on early X-ray tubes that was developed quite quickly was the rotating anode. In this design, the copper is now a little wheel that spins around so the beam wouldn't hit the same spot all the time. On the right, you can see a picture of one of these broad X-ray tubes brought over from the Cavendish when the lab was started. They were named for Tony Broad, their designer, and were a major improvement, but they still suffered from many of the same problems. So what to do? Well, they had to build a better one, of course. So in the machine shop, they set out to do just that. Yes, they actually set out to literally reinvent the wheel. Here you can see an early attempt dreamed up by Bill Longley and Ken Holmes and Hugh Huxley. By increasing the size of the copper wheel, they had more area to hit with the electron beam and could spin it faster with the same motor, both of which would increase the intensity and quality of the X-ray beam, allowing you to take better images faster. But a wheel this big, it turned out, really didn't work according to plan. You see, the, this wheel had to be spun uh, at thousands of RPM, and it was actually entirely enclosed in a vacuum chamber. And this proved just too difficult and quite honestly scary for a host of practical reasons. In the end, an anode a bit larger than a dinner plate turned out to be about right. The size was originally set by the diameter that would fit in the lathe in the machine shop, and to this day, every source has about the same size. You can see the cooling water lines leading to the copper cooling system and the rotating bearing, both of which had to be developed. It became known as the big wheel anode and was terribly successful. It was used to determine the structure of countless proteins, and it meant the LMB was ahead of everyone when it came to taking high-quality diffraction patterns and determining structures. Here you can see a picture of a complete prototype assembled in the workshop. And on the right is Tony Wallard, a long time staff member who was charged with looking after the x-ray sets. And you can see there's a big wheel in front of him. And here you can see a picture of a complete x-ray setup from 1975 designed by Hugh Huxley with help from many, including Wazi Faruqi, who helped develop several generations of x-ray detectors with Hugh and later electron detectors with Richard. And that fellow on the side there is indeed a young Richard Henderson, just before he decided to go work with Nigel Unwin on electron microscopy. The pesky problem of how to get just one energy out of the X-ray source was solved with the invention of the reflection monochromator, which you can see as the dog leg bend along the beam path. And all the complicated parts for this delicate and high precision monochromator were fabricated in house. You can see some of these individual components here. Eventually, all of this technology was commercialized, first by Elliott Brothers, a British company, and later by Rigaku from Japan. And these remained state of the art until they were eventually superseded by synchrotron radiation sources around the world. 
There are many, many more examples in the lab from Sanger's methods for DNA sequencing to Brenner's idea for tracing neuron connectivity in worms to the development of de detector technology, first for X-ray and then for electron microscopy. It includes the development of new algorithms, mathematics, software for reconstructing 3D density maps and models. And it would take hours to even list all the technological innovations that have proved important to enable discovery in the lab. But looking back on these innovations, a common principle emerges. As a scientist, you need to be able to develop your own methods and technology to do your experiments and solve the problems that need solving. If you are entirely dependent on what can be bought from commercial sources, be it reagents, instruments, or methods, you are at the mercy of the catalog and the companies. Not only that, but commercialization of any good instrument or method takes years, so you will no doubt be behind those who first developed it. Let's take one more example that is becoming a hot field now, but had its origins some 30 years ago. Time-resolved electron microscopy. You no doubt will have heard of the famous collaboration between Nigel Unwin and Richard Henderson, which led to the structure of bacteria rhodopsin in 1975. This is, of course, a tour de force in methods development applied to a terribly important problem, determining the structure of a membrane protein. Both went on to work on many other aspects of protein structure determination. But there's another problem that they both worked on independently that is now turning into a significant field in its own right, which is time-resolved structure determination. After bacteria rhodopsin, Nigel began to work on other membrane proteins and was interested in the transient and fleeting behavior of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor in a membrane. This involved terribly difficult experiments and the dynamics were even more challenging to access structurally. So together with John Berryman, he developed a device that allowed one to spray a ligand onto the specimen of receptors at a fixed time before the grid was plunged into liquid ethane. It was then frozen in time and thus could be captured only a millisecond or two after activation. You can see a diagram of the device here and a subsequent version, which was built in the early 80s in our machine shop by Steve Scotcher. In the next slide, you can see a video of one of these instruments in action. The grid plunges into the ethane and just before it hits the surface, a puff of the ligand is deposited on the grid, which triggers the receptor. Meanwhile, Richard continued to work on bacteria rhodopsin, both to determine the high resolution structure, but also to explore its dynamics as it is activated by photon absorption and it cycles through a range of conformational states. Together with Sriram Subramaniam and others, he designed a plunger that was able to flash a pulse of ultraviolet light on the grid to trigger the cycle of BR and capture its transient behavior. Here you can see a photo from Richard's notebook of the first successful flash plunge. The light is focused on the grid and is pulsed a fixed time before it hits the cold ethane. It is then frozen just after the moment of activation. Studying dynamics was not new to structural biology. Hugh Huxley and others were using X-ray pulsing uh, and time resolved work to study muscle contraction and the actin myosin mechanism for many years before cryo-EM. But even today, there is much excitement about time resolved cryo-EM, as you can see from these, public, uh, these papers, which were all published in the last year. And people are especially excited about the possible introduction of new commercial time resolved plungers but this is already some 25 years after they were successfully demonstrated at the LMB. Just consider the time delay here, literally decades if you were to wait until you could just write a grant to buy the instrument to do this experiment. As many of you know, the LMB moved into a new shed in 2013. It was designed and planned again by the scientists and true to the original building, one of the first spaces to be fitted out was, was the workshops. Here you can see a photo of the shop just before the machines were installed. It's now filled with lathes and mills and all the things you need to build instruments. But more importantly, the tradition of employing highly skilled engineers and tradespeople to design, manufacture and test new instruments continues. And it's critical to the success of the lab now as much as ever. I'll show you just one recent example from our own work of an instrument that started from a blank sheet of paper and is now in the final phases of testing. It's a plasma-based surface modification system for the production of custom surface chemistries on graphene for cryo-EM. And it was designed, prototyped, built, and tested entirely in the workshops here at the LMB. 
The new lab is also home to a large range of facilities that grew organically out from the original stores and workshops. The key factor in the success of these facilities is the employment of long-term scientific staff who often are the keepers of the knowledge in many ways. They are the ones who take the many technologies and methods developed over the years and apply them to hosts of new problems. They are also key to teaching the new students and postdocs, enabling them to just get on with their work, as Max would have said. We now have a wide range of facilities staffed by first-rate scientists, engineers, and specialists, but the ethos remains the same. Allow people to just get on with their work as fast as possible. In preparing this talk and reflecting on the history and success of methods development to the LMB, I've drawn a few conclusions about the culture of successful methods development. First, the cutting edge instruments and methods in biology often cannot be bought at any price. They need to be invented and developed. And people, not shiny expensive boxes or machines are the key to this. Second, if you solely rely on instruments, kits and methods that can be bought, you will always be two to five years behind the cutting edge because commercialization takes at least that long. Technology and science always marches on and you must be constantly ready to take the next leap. And that may even may mean making the thing or method you worked on for years obsolete. Some technologies, especially hardware, take years of development and have many blind alleyways and dead ends, just like that big wheel. Be prepared for these and stay focused on the problems over the long term. And finally, you must be ruthless about abandoning dead ends, even if they are your own ideas or things you were successful at for years. Eventually, the correct path in science is found, and then it leaps forward. In case you were not convinced yet about the importance of methods development to the success of, of the lab, you need only consider the list of Nobel Prizes, from protein and DNA sequencing to the production of monoclonal antibodies to cryo-EM, pretty much all of these awards had at their heart the development of a new method or technology that somehow enabled discovery. I think Sidney Brenner really summed it up best. Progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. I think sometimes that order is reversed, but these, ingredient, these three ingredients remain the origin of scientific revolutions. Finally, I wanna thank especially several people who helped me put all these materials together for this talk. If you're interested in learning more about the history and culture of the LMB and how it developed, the best reference is John Finch's book. Further, more, uh, the more recent volume of Memories edited by Hugh Huxley gives many insightful perspectives on what makes the culture of the LMB special. And Horace Judson's book is a comprehensive work that's very helpful for providing a more broad perspective on the development of molecular biology as a whole. I hope I've given you a glimpse of the culture of the LMB and I look forward to our discussion. Chris, thank you. That was extremely inspirational and always good to be reminded of everything that you all have accomplished over the, the decades. Um, so, can, can you speak a bit about how LMB and maybe British science in general uh, solved the problem of incentivization of such research? Uh, you know, I would say we, we all acknowledge that tools are, are critical, but certainly in the US, um, we haven't done a good job of, of uh, being able to incentivize that work. How did you guys thread the, the needle? Well, I think the, the, I hate to beat an old saw, but I think the, the so-called grant cycle has a lot to do with it, actually. So I don't think we're immune to it here in the UK either. I think the, the LMB is, is a unique place because it has um, the privilege of this long-term funding where we're evaluated only every five years and they really value us working on difficult problems that are, you know, 10, 15, even 20 year or more problems that pay off in the long run. And, and, and that's really our sort of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, whereas when you're on a three year cycle of, you know, here's the next paper, here's the next grant, here's the next, uh, th this is what makes it very difficult, I think. I think, um, it, yeah, so I think that's, that's a big part of it. Yeah, it was, certainly that's a huge part. I mean, it, it seems like there must be something much more intrinsic at a at a cultural level, some problem that you all have managed to solve. 
um, you know, HHMI funds its red uh, its investigators for seven years at a time, um, so we can do longer term stuff. But but you know, still, I would say the number of us doing methods development is probably less than five percent of the entire pool. Hmm. Well, I think you know it can't all be methods development at a lab because in order to be focused on the right problems. You, you still have to have a large concentration of people who are sort of discovery science focused, you know, they're, they're after that next important thing. And then that helps all of us who are actually doing methods development, focus our minds on what needs to be worked on. So then, then we're not wasting our time going down some blind alley as much as we might otherwise. So I think that's another important thing is, um, you know, I, I came from the US, I was in the US system. And there were quite a few places in the US that did foster this kind of culture through the years um, in, in various disciplines. Um, I think Bell Labs was a one, certainly one, a famous one for years. And that's where my PhD advisor spent a lot of his career actually. So that was sort of uh, imbued early. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is something special about what it's like to do science here, which has to do with this just get on with it attitude. And I think that's, that's really um, important to, to sort of treasure. And the more places can have that attitude, the better off we all are actually. Yeah, um, I wanted to push back very slightly on something you said, uh, which was about uh, commercialization. I mean, mm. certainly, you know, places like Bell Labs uh, benefited from the fact that there were enormous consequences for their discoveries in terms of uh, consumer technology, et cetera. So everything that has knock-on benefits with something that is readily um, turned into a product to, to be sold to consumers, um, yeah, th th there the commercialization problem tends to take care of itself. But yeah. um, many things certainly in the life sciences are not really amenable to that. So how no. do we solve the how do we solve the problem of technology that's critical, but doesn't really make a device that you and I both want to run out and buy at the store? Yeah, absolutely. This is a terribly important point. And I didn't really talk about it in, in, in this area at all. So, but this is something we face every day when in our own work developing instruments, how do we get it so that other labs can use them? And I think Janelia actually has quite a good um, strategy on this. Um, where, you know, you make things available to everybody who wants to, uh, you know, the designs, the drawings, the, the, you know, open source code, et cetera, make them available to the academic research community, just give it away to everyone, uh, especially things that really aren't, you know, they're not going to be in the department stores, or you're not going to buy them in a grocery store, right? This is not the sort of thing that we're worried about. So really, all we care about is getting them in the hands of other scientists. So there, you give away as much as possible. But on the other hand, you know, the, the prototypes and the things that we build in the shop are often kind of rigged together, held together with uh, tape, uh, you know, duct tape and wire kind of deals. And there is a big benefit to having a company go all the way and commercialize something to the level where it's, it's properly engineered, you press a button, it works, you can call somebody and have it serviced. All of these things are, are extremely, you know, I don't want to downplay the importance of this. Once a technology is properly developed and commercialized, it becomes very useful to everyone. And so a big part of the impact of, of methods development is actually the commercialization part of it so that you can go and buy microscopes or lenses or anything else that you know, started out as, as little projects. Um, on the other hand, a lot of the cutting edge stuff happens right as soon as the thing starts working. So if you really want to be at the bleeding edge, you do have to be either, you know, taking commercial instruments and modifying them or somehow doing them, you know, coming up with them yourselves. Um, but I think you, you always have to have both of these things in mind. Uh, and I think, um, you know, our strategy with sort of IP and licensing, you know, it's one thing for a drug to be licensed and, and you know, and, and protected and marketed, but it's a whole other thing for a microscope. And in most cases there, our goal is not to, to make any money. Our goal is to get the technology in the hands of all the scientists. And that, that is the key thing. And, and that actually takes a lot of effort. And there's a lot of people involved in that um, here, as well as you know, many other labs that do this sort of development work. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, we have a comment from Reed George uh, for, so for context, 
Um, Reed is the head of uh, the group uh, project teams at, at Genelia, the share of resources and project teams, which are like little um, biotech companies uh, trying to do something. He says, uh, thank you for articulating so well how technologists and scientists must rely on each other to make important progress. We all benefit so much from what the LMB has achieved directly and culturally. And I just want to echo, echo that. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, that the LMB has, has made such a mark on the world uh, over, over all this time. So, um, yeah, on, on that note, thanks to Chris and uh, Jason for the excellent talks. Uh, thanks to the audience for joining the, um, us and for your good question. Uh, go to the chat box where you will see two things. You will see a uh, link to the LSAG seminar website where you can see upcoming speakers, uh, watch old talks and subscribe to the talks. And you will also find a link to the Slack channel where Chris and Jason will join and answer your questions and maybe you can meet some new collaborators, et cetera. Um, if you don't see the channel for the, uh, this uh, today's talks on there, then uh, make sure you navigate up to the channel plus and add the channel. Uh, I've made that mistake myself. Um, so next week's speakers will be uh, Jan Corbell and Brendan Roos from the EMBL. So catch us next week um, at the same time for those talks. And again, thank you uh, very much and stay safe and sane.